next speaker from Viridian Capital and Research, Scott Greifer. Is that how you pronounce the last name? If you can speak and write, you will figure out the pronunciation. Thank you. So I have to apologize for being another Wall Street guy here, but at least Matt wore jeans, so he's a lot cooler than I am. I've, we are the first investment banking firm that had the balls to actually enter the <coughs> cannabis space and yes. back and build private and public cannabis companies. And maybe we'll go to jail one day, I'm not sure, I doubt it, but uh, the risks are well worth it to us. So I'll tell you before I get into us, and I'm going to blow through this first part because it's really a pitch to a potential client. I want to get to the back end and really talking to you guys about how Wall Street is accepting and the capital markets are embracing cannabis companies. You know, five years ago, there were maybe five publicly traded cannabis companies, and today there's about 250. We follow about 60 or 70 of them. And the market value of the companies we follow, which is a, about a quarter of the market, is close to $4 billion today. So there is a real acceptance recognition of the growth opportunities in this market and the opportunities to innovate technology, start new businesses, and become a real player. I've spent my career trying to get ahead of curves like this and what I do for a living is find what I think are the best emerging growth tech providers in a market. Not a startup, but a company that may be in the market for a year doing a half a million dollars in revenues or four years doing $10 million in revenues and now they're trying to get to that proverbial, proverbial next level. And it really is all about building the capabilities of the team. This is all about people. What's really lacking, what I think the biggest risk in this space that you didn't have, and by the way, I thought your presentation was great. Thanks. You bring such a social, cool perspective on this. The biggest risk in this space that we see is the lack of seasoned professional executives that know how to run businesses, know how to govern businesses, know how to build models, raise the right capital, execute a business. That's what's missing in this space. And no disrespect to the guys that have been growing pot in San Francisco in their backyard for 12 years, and now they're the CEO of a public company that's got a hundred million dollar market cap, but it's our call that that company is going to be gone in a couple of years. That's not going to be able to be sustainable. So what we do for our companies is we help bring in and build the right board of directors. I'll give you examples of this. We like to bet on the CEO. I'm not here to try to come in and lop the head off and bring our own guy in. We like to bet on the jockey, but we'll bring in a chief financial officer that has real reporting standards experience, a real COO that can really manage the growth of a company. That's the first kind of touch point we have on our clients, which is all that matters. It's bringing in the right people that have the capability to, to manage a business, to build a business. You know, the, the trickiest part is success, managing growth. And that leads to, that's our advisory practice, that leads to our turning on our other practice, which is our investment banking firm. So once we kind of have built capability and credibility, we can go out and raise money, or at least try to go out and raise money. And that's, that's what I've built in our latest practice called Viridian Capital Research. So if you go back one slide, I just want to see. If, uh, OK. Please? Yeah. So what I'm going to show you is, this is a show for us, but I want you to see the quality of the people that have been attracted to our business. Okay, these are real people, like Matt from Wall Street, and you'll see people from government, huge entrepreneurs, the FBI, the CIA, that want to join what we're doing because we're bringing legitimacy to this market. So there's me, Mark Sauter, who's head of uh, M&A for us. He started the first, uh, my background is really in Homeland Security, by the way. I built another practice just like this right after 9-11, where I built and financed a lot of companies doing really cool stuff in video surveillance and cybersecurity. And I will tell you that the cannabis opportunity is way bigger and way killer compared to the security business, which was really cool after 9-11, still is. So Mark ran for the NSA, the U.S. government's first incubator in cybersecurity. 
and he worked for the largest M&A firm in security and defense. And now I get him back working for me in pot. So interesting <laughs> career evolution for Mark. Mike, who's standing over there, is um, uh, the first analyst I brought on at Viridian. And lucky for me, Mike, on behalf of his dad, who's a serial entrepreneur, has been ripping through pot companies' K's and Q's because his dad has been investing in the space for three years. And Mike, I think, is the smartest analyst in this space. Please go ahead. But here's my board. And um, I build my board not only to give us uh, expertise, advice, insight, um, to allow us to scale our business, but we, it allows us to better advise our clients. And I have a little bit of a bullpen system. I get paid to build boards for my companies, as I say. I take these guys from my board and stick them on our clients' boards. And they carry a lot of the weight and bring a lot of credibility and a lot of visibility and a lot of insight and a lot of market access. So you got a guy like uh, Ambassador Siegel. He is a Republican. And uh, uh, he's been uh, one of the chief fundraisers for the Bush family in South Florida for about 14 years. That's how he's gotten all these political appointments. Um, he's Jeb Bush's partner right now and leading the fundraising for Jeb Bush. That is my partner in Viridian, and he had to get permission from the U.S. government, the State Department, and permission from Jeb Bush to enter the cannabis market, and he got it. There was only one prohibition. He couldn't work and couldn't sit on the board of any company that touches the plant. But I will tell you that's going away too because TerraTech, a public company that touches and grows and has a family legacy of cultivation and greenhouses going back decades, uh, got their registration statement, this might not be anything to you, approved by the SEC. The SEC said, okay, you can go out of registered shares. This company touches and grows pot and they're public. And so this is a milestone for the industry to take off this this uh, you know, taint, this uh, red line that you can't touch the plant. That's bullshit. You can now. So we're changing our whole dynamic. We're, now we're going after the cultivators and all that technology. Jennifer Love is the highest ranking female FBI agent in the agency's history. She, her last job was assistant director of security for the FBI. She's currently the chief security officer of Cablevision. They own the Knicks and the Rangers, so you guys can boo because they suck. <laughs> but what's interesting about Jennifer is she's a black woman. And I interviewed her. We have her on the board of one of our uh, public companies. And I mentioned that she's black because I interviewed her. And I asked, what the hell are you doing here? You know, well, I don't even know why Cablevision let you join this board, my board. And she said, well, I have young, two teenage boys. And they're doing great, but they have friends that are incarcerated because they bought a joint, they sold a diamond. The, the, you mentioned the 10X thing, and that's why she's in this industry, to cure that ill. Which as a white guy, frankly, I didn't think of it. I, I kind of knew the statistics, but so many benefits, so many social benefits. And so here's Jennifer Love, who brings us so much uh, expertise in how law enforcement is prosecuting uh, cannabis. Then you got a guy, Mitch Lowe. Mitch was a, co he was a college roommate of Reed Hastings, and he co-founded Netflix, and then he went to, uh, on to co-found and become the president of Redbox. Mitch, it, Mitch lives in Mill Valley. He's the coolest guy in the world. He grew up in California. He wears tattered jeans and loafers. He's just the most low-key guy. He's all in on cannabis. He thinks this is, you know, if, if you think Netflix was a social revolution, he thinks this is the social revolution. So. Fortunate enough, uh, had a chance to meet the guy. He sits on one of our public company boards, sits on our board. But you mentioned as one of your risks, I'm jumping around, one of the risks in this market really is reputation. And for a guy like this, now, and I guess he doesn't care. He's worth $3 billion, so what does he give a shit? But his neighbors probably care. He was probably concerned about that, maybe his teenage children. But he, he's, he's dived in and is all in on cannabis. It's really kind of interesting. Next, please. So I said the, the biggest risk I see in this space for investors is trying to find people that you believe are not only capable of managing a business and innovating technology and raising money, but aren't criminals. 
and uh, guys you don't trust. Uh, sort of the sordid side of this industry is very much there. And I don't care about that. I'm not judging these people, but when they're the CEO of a public company, you better be damn careful about investing in their stock. Because there's been a big handful of companies that has had their trading suspended. We went through an issue with one of our companies where the CEO, the founder, is a criminal. And this guy, within four years of entering the pot business, was the first billionaire, on paper, in public companies. Guy was worth a billion dollars, and he's going to live in government housing soon. And he deserves to go live in government housing soon because he's a criminal. Nobody knew it. Nobody did their homework to do it. So we spent the last year and a half unwinding this thing. So in order to give us the opportunity to really do our homework on behalf of our investors and our companies, I brought in Don V. Don's uh, father started a company called Interfor a bunch of years ago. They're the one of the leading private investigation firms in the country. Not to track your spouse, but to, for example, on behalf of two of the largest private equity firms in the world, Carlisle and BlackRock, when they're buying a company, they hire Don to diligence the people, the assets, the money, the trails. So I want Don on my side because I, I can't afford to make mistakes and the mistakes are going to be made on backing the wrong people. Branding in this space is a really cool opportunity. Not, not just to have a brand name, but to establish integrity. This is a consumer product. This is going to appear on shelves at some point in time, not just in the dispensary. How do you know that what you buy here in this dispensary is the same over there? How do you know that the, the integrity of the way it was grown makes it a product that could be consumed here? How do you know that strain being sold in that part of Colorado by that brand name is the same over there? You don't. There's no pharmaceutical-like uh, consistency, standardization in producing cannabis and strains and, and varieties of cannabis, let alone that some of them have molds and bacteria and not good stuff that you're in, ingesting. So the branding side is becoming really very interesting. As an aside, before I talk about David's background, we got a call three weeks ago from a merchandising licensing firm that owns all the merchandising rights to The Who, uh, Genesis, The Stones, The Police. They're very big. They just bought the rights to Woodstock because in four years, it's the 50th anniversary of Woodstock. So they'll do hats and you know, T-shirts and buttons and whatever the hell they do. Well, what do they want to do? They want to do Woodstock weed. We got a call. I don't know the first freaking thing about branding or producing that, but this guy does. As you can see from his background, he's killer. He's cool. He's currently representing a rapper by the name of Trey Song. Is that his name? I don't know that guy. <laughs> Michael knows that guy. And David is building a liquor spirits brand around this guy. And now we're going to be building a weed brand around the guy. And what spurred him on to do this is he was at a concert in uh, at the Barclays Center in Brooklyn a month ago, whatever. And Snoop Dogg gets up to sing on stage with him, breaks out his vape. And now Trey Song wants his own vape as well. So. Really interesting ways to build businesses in this market, even for a kind of a traditional Wall Street guy. So we brought on David Knight. Finally, a guy named James Canton. I didn't know who he was up until about six months ago, but this is a former CIA operative who's still deeply embedded in the US government, but he's become a futurist. And he advises, I wasn't able to put the names of the companies here, the biggest companies in the world, on emerging trends and how to plan your tech innovation and your tech development and your business development about what's to come. All of a sudden, this guy's bringing me opportunities to buy cultivation, dispensaries, and he's, I don't think he smokes pot. He was in the CIA, so he doesn't. He's all in, in this space. So the reputational risk management side is really, I think, the biggest risk to guys like me. I have a five and a 10-year-old at home, and I don't know what the hell I'm gonna tell my kids when they ask what daddy does in five years. It's gonna be an interesting point. But this guy's jumping in, so, we're going to hold our own Viridian conference in New York a couple of months. Hopefully, I'll get a mailing list so we can invite you guys. It's all going to be kind of how to come out as a legitimate person, business person, and look to invest in this space because maybe you don't want your wife, your kids, your neighbor, your limited partners, your CEO to know. So I don't have to say a word. I just have to march out these people 
and the CEOs of our public companies and our private clients and say, these people have come in and they're making it work. And so, next please. So we raise money. Next. <laughs> this is really what I think is the magic of what we do, is we bring credibility, legitimacy, professionalization, institutionalization to, frankly, this industry that doesn't have a lot of it on the, on the business side. It's not a judgment. That's just kind of the nature of, the, of what it is. So that's our first touch point. So we build boards. We build teams. We, we have very deeply embedded relationships with the DEA. Obviously, the FBI, Jennifer, is on our board, Health and Human Services. We want to understand how things are going to roll, not just legislatively at the federal level, but how police law, enforce, law enforcement is going to prosecute it at the, in the, on the ground. And as you may know, Governor de Blasio, uh, uh, Mayor de Blasio and Police Commissioner Bratton got up about four months ago and said, we're not arresting for small amounts of possession, and they're not. They'll ticket you, they'll fine you, but that nuance change to me is as important as Schedule 1 coming off Schedule 2. It changes the dynamic on the ground. So this is kind of how we do what we do. This is how we try to bring value to our companies in building up eventually to what the only thing they want is money. So eventually building up to, to being able to raise the money and then ultimately to have a big successful exit to a strategic investor, which by the way, there are no strategic investors in this market. The tobacco companies are not in, the spirits companies are not in, Monsanto's not in, there's no big brand uh, OEMs. It's too dangerous for them to come into this market. They're looking and they're researching and they're identifying who's developing some early market share because they're gonna come in and they're gonna buy their way in. They're not gonna get a license. They're just going to buy their way in. They're going to buy the market share leaders. It, it, it likely won't happen until Schedule 1 changes, although Mike and I have made a call that we'll see the first strategic investor this year. We think it's going to be Monsanto because of the cultivation opportunity. But that's the highest end of what we, what we try to accomplish for our clients is when it's ready, we're going to try to sell them. And we have M&A practice to do that, and you know, that's where everybody you know, has a party. So in terms of the industry, it's, I could talk about this all day, so you've got to shut me up it, when you so need to shut me up. Right. This is really the one yard line going the long way. This is the most fascinating market I've ever participated in, and I'm old enough to be, you know, I was banking 23-year-old kids in 1996 with the age of the internet that were coming in asking for $20 million. I'm like, you, you don't even know how to change your underwear. How do you know how to spend $20 million? But what's really interesting about this market that's uh, unique compared to any other technology market that I've watched about. Normally a company comes in, they give you their business model, and there's only one thing you have to understand, which is how you get to your customer. Where's the demand side? Who's buying your stuff? I don't care what you're selling. Who's buying your stuff? How do you get to them? And then how do you scale? Because new technology means new buyers, new markets. There's not a market there for it. The market has to develop. We don't need one more buyer of cannabis today. There's $50 billion worth of cannabis bought in the U.S. every year, five zero billion. Don't need another buyer. 2.7 billion of it is bought in the light. 42.5 billion is still bought on this street corner in the dark. And it's just going to slowly evolve and move this way. That is a really unique dynamic to this industry. And I think ultimately why the investors are looking to come in, because you don't have to prove demand. You just have to create regulations and best practices and standards to serve the demand. Again, I keep saying it, but it's the truth. This is our party line. We write research about it. The problem is the lack of uh, real professional teams. And that's great, because that's what we do. It's what we get paid to do. It's not easy to find these people, because most people are, you know, despite whatever capabilities, they don't want to be in the drug business. So. These guys that are coming on the margin, Ambassador Siegel and James Cann, they're on the margin. The, the meat of, of the real seasoned executives are not in this sector yet. Business models are, you know, pricing is so variable. It's so early. Business models are not proven. That's a, that's a real risk. The lack of best practices, reporting standards, knowing how to run a public company, how to have a board that has independent board, really just people are just learning how to do it. The institutional investors have been out of the market 
almost entirely up until a year ago, until uh, maybe two years ago, a company called Privateer came into the market. It was a really the first private equity firm that took the leap. And then the real tipping point was four months ago when Peter Thiel of PayPal and the Founders Fund, Seed Investor, and Facebook invested in Privateer. And if there's any acknowledgement that hugely successful guys have the balls to step into the market, that was it. So now we're starting to see the establishment of private equity firms and more funds being started very, very early still. This market, at least on the public side, is still dominated by you. Individual investors are going to go buy 100 shares in the market, and that's fine, but that's not, that doesn't support big, successful companies at the end of the day. So here's a little, on the public companies, we're up to 250 public companies right now. They do lack liquidity. I'll move on if I could. So uh, being the geek uh, that I am inside, I lead all of my businesses with research because I want to establish that we're experts in the space. We have perspective. We have insight. Um, we can advise you on how to build your business because we understand trends, we understand history, we understand financing. So we have one copy of the report here. It's literally the only one we have left. It's $30,000, first come, first serve. Um, but this also gets us to the institutional investor, to the professional investor who wants to see the, the kind of work that Matt does to really become smart and educated and make a very uh, good bet. So this is how we launched Viridian into the marketplace. Uh, just last uh, August. The cannabis market is not homogeneous. There's a lot of different technologies and service offerings and business models. So we, we cut up the industry into 10 different sectors. You got software to track the seed, to the bud, to the plant, to the transport, to the dispensary, to the sale to you. It's called seed to sale. You guys have heard of it. To me, it's the most important part of this industry because ultimately, the IRS does not recognize a sale of pot at the dispensary as a legitimate sale because if they did, they would let that dispensary owner deduct normal business operating expenses, and they don't. So until you can really uh, uh, secure that supply chain and prove the legitimacy of the origination of the product, the transportation of the product, the sale of the product, only then will interstate commerce develop, treasury recognize it, IRS recognizes that software. You got physical security, my background, because it's an all-cash business at the dispensary, as you know. These guys, some of these guys are making a million a week. It's all cash. They're paying their light bills in cash. They're paying their employees in cash. And then they have to go in their car with a guard with an uh, automated weapon to go pay their taxes in cash. So the security side of this thing is very severe. So all these different kind of uh, sectors of the market. So I probably should have started off with this because this is kind of the cool data. So well, you guys can find this out for yourself. This is how the public companies have performed in 2013 and then each of the quarters of 2014 and then 2014 in a whole. We have our own index. We don't trade it. We just use it to kind of track. About 70 companies uh, that we follow in the space. So in 2013, the market was up 77.5%, which beat every other indice, that Jones, S&P, very handily. Excuse me, you had some sick performance among the sectors. Software was up 722%, and biotech, which is a really cool market here, was up 90%. And then you look at Q1 of 14, the market was up 938%. And then look what happened in the subsequent three quarters. There was a bubble in this, in this industry, and the market corrected. It still needs to correct. The valuations are still way too extended, but they're, I wouldn't say they're reasonable, but they're, they've come back into the stratosphere, not the, not the solar system. Even despite that, there's still great performance, right? Uh, consulting up 169% and cultivation up. There's still money to be made, and uh, on the whole, we ended up up 38% for the year. There's a lot of money to be made in the sector. You've got to be really selective, you have to do your homework, and you have to do your homework on two things, the people and the plan. It's hard to do in public companies as individual investors. It's just, it's doable, but it's difficult. That's one of the reasons we exist, and investors pay us to do that work for them. These are the best performers in each of the sectors. Again, you got some, you know, 1,100% gain for Novus. Uh, 
a lot of money to be made in the sector. So this is kind of interesting. Who's raising money? Which public companies are actually able to go out and get investors, not you in buying a share of stock, but to lend them or give them a million or two million dollars? So in 2014, 47 of the couple of hundred public companies actually raise money, which is really a failure when you think about it. How do these public companies exist? You need to raise capital, which should tell you that a lot of these public companies are not going to be here next year. But the 47 companies that did raised 80 million bucks. So that tells you another thing. That's what? Less than a million and a half, a million and three quarters each raise. They're not raising a lot of money. And they have to raise another round, and another round, and another round, and another round. So we get paid to raise money. And it's great to raise a million. I'd rather raise 10. So again, you've got to be really picky on the companies that you believe in the model, you believe in the plan, you believe in their ability to deploy $10 million. What are they going to do with it? How does it generate growth? The top three sectors are raising the most capital are there. Consulting services is really cool. Um, these are the companies that investors come to to say, can you help me get a license? And can you put the book together? And can you build a board of really high profile local people in the state? Because it's still a politically polluted process. And can get me my license. And after you get me my license, I need to identify the piece of real estate that's zoned. And then you got to find me a manager because I don't know how to run the thing. So the consulting side is very significant. Our most important client is in this business. And because the rules are so variable state to state, it is not easy. So until things are standardized across states, which is not going to happen until federal legalization comes, this is a great business to be in. Terratech. So here's the company that has generations of experience in greenhouse cultivation, not in pot, in lettuce and strawberries and leafy vegetables and and they've seen, they've seen the light, and now they're all in in the United States in cannabis. Public company. Just got the SEC to, it's not really called approving, but approved their registration statement to sell more shares. That was a landmark event uh, for this space. But again, most of the companies are small. By the way, I don't mean to sound negative on this. I love it all. I love the gray. I don't want, federal, I don't want Schedule 1 to come off yet, because that's the opportunity for me and my small companies. When Schedule 1 goes to 2, and Philip Morris is in this thing, you know, I'm, I'm much less important to my clients than I am right now. Mergers and acquisitions, companies buying each other, is becoming a, a much more dynamic part of the market for a couple of reasons. There's a chase to uh, be everything to all people. I'm going to be a consulting company. I'm going to be in biotech. I'm going to be in the real estate side. I'm going to lend you money mainly because nobody's really sure which model is going to work at the end of the day, so let's try to diversify, number one. Number two, many of these public companies are not going to make it. They can't finance themselves to even afford the cost of being public. So their underlying assets are now coming loose, and we're going after this heavy. <coughs> so if you are a good public company, real people, real plans, real experience, real, expert, real history of, of success, you can pick up assets and accelerate your growth uh, in a very significant way, way right now. So we're seeing a lot of M&A transactions happening. This was 14, 20, 29 companies out of the 200 public did 46 deals. This is exploding right now, um, and we hope to be in the middle of it. Still, again, the deals are small, reflecting the very early uh, stage of the market. So I don't know if these numbers mean anything to you guys, but they are uh, off the charts in terms of valuation. You know, a fast-growing company that's in, I don't know, uh, makes servers uh, that does 200 million a year might trade at a enterprise value to revenues of five times, six times, if it's really fast-growing. If it's uh, a medium growth company, it'll trade at two times revenues. The average company in this space is trading at 31 times revenue. So either these companies better pick up their pace and grow real faster, or they're going to come down. They're going to come down. Except for, of course, our clients. The highest value sectors, biotech is off the charts because that is the future of this industry. You know, ultimately, it is going to get down to understanding the genomics, the DNA of the seed, the bud that it, it, it creates, the strain that's pulled off, the formulations of those strains in a consistent, standardized way that's going to be in a pill. And if you have glaucoma, it's that. If you have epilepsy, it's that. 
real specificity in terms of strains to your malady. And the U.S. is so far behind in this sector, which is unusual for us. We lead the world in innovation. Because it's been an illegal drug, the universities have not gotten funding to do the research. So Israel and Europe are kicking our ass. And um, in fact, those companies are now coming into the states and getting investment from the states. That's why you see the valuation here. Because ultimately, these are the pharmaceutical companies in five years. And these are the companies that are going to get picked off. Soft software, I talked about securing that supply chain so that the states and the federal government recognize the legitimacy of that sale is critical. And real estate has gone nuts, but the peak is over. You know, in 2012, when legalization, rec legalization happened in Colorado and Washington, the real estate investors rushed to the outskirts, the industrial parts of Colorado and Washington because a dispensary has to be a thousand miles from a school, a thousand miles from each other, a thousand miles from a church, all these rules. So it got pushed out from the center of town. And so the investors rushed to buy these properties, knock down whatever was in there and build, build the cultivation facility. They're trading at three times the place next door that's 999 feet from a school and is not zoned. So I think the, the market opportunity is there, is not there in the real estate anymore. I'm going to end with that. I don't know what comes after this, but I, uh, I'm going to say stop. Um, the challenges are is, is the challenges of any early stage market, but it's really acute here. Business models and forecasting and management and executional capability, kind of the pillars of um, entrepreneurialism are lacking here. A lot of the companies have done what's called toxic financing. If you want to get into that, I can get into it. But Basically, when stock prices are coming down, the loans and the investment that these guys are getting are, gets much more expensive. Uh, and stock prices are coming down. It's really pressuring their balance sheet. What does that mean? They're not going to get more money. So we're going to see more public companies go away. It doesn't mean, by the way, that there's going to be less public companies because there's more coming every week. But we're starting to see some rationalization. Oh.